bio at CC2021. I hope you enjoy it. And let's start with our first presentation uh, with the paper Design and Manufacture of a Training System for Ventriculostomy. And it's going to be presented by Abimael Terrones Acosta. Thank you, Abimael, for yours, please. Yes, thank you, Doctor. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Abimael Terrones Acosta, and today I'm going to present you the paper named Design and Manufacture of a Training System for Ventriculostomy. Uh, the content of the presentation are the following, and we are going to start with the abstract. Well, an aerodoscopic training system was developed. This one consists in an algorithm and a training station. This means we have a virtual and a physical part. Uh, consists of uh, using the, the necessary hardware and software, images are obtained uh, through a pair of cameras located orthogonally. The development of the project consists of two main stages, identification of the instrument and the registration of the coordinates for extract some metrics. Well, uh, medical training systems are used in the educational field to develop and improve technical skills and provide controlled environments of real situations. Nowadays, about 70% of learning centers have a kind of trainer or simulator systems. Well, the ventriculostomy or EBD, external ventricular drain, is a neurosurgical procedure in which a catheter is placed into the cerebral ventricles for draining cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, EBD is one of the first interventions that novices in neurosurgery must learn. But we have some complications. For example, blinding can occur in 30 to 40 percent, infections in 20 percent, and 20 percent of the insertions performed failed to hit the ventricles. Uh, in very extraordinary cases, that is a possibility. These complications do necessarily the use of training systems before they perform a ventriculostomy. Nowadays, the systems uh, for these interventions are based mainly on virtual reality system and physical models. How was developed our project? Well, as we said, our project consists in a training station and a software. The training station is conformed by black panels, MDF, and a metallic structure for rigidity. Uh, both make up the training bots. Uh, when we use image processing illumination is a very important part for this reason we we have a 30 watts light in our training box cameras uh, also also are used to obtain image images of the uh, intervention all the time an inclined base is um, is used to uh, adopt the supino position with the head inclined 30 degrees as in a, a real intervention. Green passive markers are located in the catheter and in the anatomical model to um, uh, know the position of these two elements all the time. Also a computer that contains the software. Well, uh, the training station also contains an anatomical model, consists in a school model divided into parts because it's necessary can open and close the model. It have a pair of markers to know every time its position. Also have a stoma reemplaceable for re repetitive training. Stoma is used to make an orifice in the culture points. The culture points is located uh, one centimeter to coronal uh, suture and three centimeters to midline, as we can see in the image. Uh, the training station also have a brain model into um, the school model. Uh, also, a brain model and school model are printed in 3D. This model consists in a pair of reemplaceable brain models made of silicon. Um, a hollow ventricular system is also located into the brain model and a system for holding all the 
um, all the um, all the anatomical model. As we said, we need record some metrics as training time, catheter angle, insertion leg, and linearity of insertion. Also, we need provide visual feedback and a software um, for do this task was developed in Python in conjunction with OpenCV library for image processing and the Kinter, li the Kinter library for the graphical interface. When we start the algorithms, uh, the, algorith the algorithm start with a graphical login interface. Once the user login, the main user interface is displayed. At this interface, we have three principal views for anatomical models, um, labels for angles, labels for insertion, the time, and a pair of buttons, one to start the procedure or and the other one to calibrate the system. Before start the training, a calibration is needed to system works properly. The calibration consists in choose the cameras for system and adjust HSB levels to identify the green color in markers. Um, HSB is a color space like RGB, but HSB consider hue, saturation, and value. Once the trading process begins, images representing the position of the anatomical model will be updated. Time continuum uh, will begin, and finally, the cameras will begin to acquire uh, images and process it to future extraction. But how, how it works? Well, the first step is the image processing. First, we need to calibrate the radial distortion for the cameras. Then we need to rotate the access images to trade the image like a Cartesian plane. Uh, then we need to convert the RGB image kept, uh, obtained by the camera in HSB to uh, implement the HSB range calibrated previously to the TED markers in the catheter and anatomical model. And then we erode and dilate the pixels group detected to maintain only which represent markers. Um, then we obtain the centroid of each pixel group and store it uh, coordinates in different variables, as we can see in the image. We uh, store the three centroids in different um, variables to uh, the future extraction. Well, uh, through coordinates, we can calculate the angle. Uh, this is calculating the slope of the catheter and display in the graphical interface. Also, we represent the catheter through a stretch line in the interface and um, calculate the insertion leg in the anatomical model. Finally, the time also is displayed in the, um, in the principal interface. So we can see in this image. Also, we print uh, a label that in, indicate the position of the catheter. In this case, the catheter is in the third ventricle. Once procedure is completed, in the graphical interface, we observe the linearity. This is the variation of the angle dura during the insertion. Also, we can see new buttons, reset, uh, exit, and graph. Reset help us to start a new procedure. Exit is for close the system, and graph is for display uh, some metrics. If we push the graph button, a new window is opened. Here we can see the path of the catheter in three views. Uh, also, we have a 3D graph that we can manipulate. And not only the current procedure can be displayed, we can select another one and display it. If we want to analyze our performance dur during procedures, we can also display a graph with all times procedures and linearities. Well, here we have a uh, a very short video um, of our system working. Sample here we have um, the virtual part and the physical part. 
and allow labels for uh, some metrics, like angle, insertion, the time, and the position of the catheter. What about our results? As we can see, a proper cell trainer was developed, which consists of a training station and software. The system respond to the needs to of touch feedback using 3D printing and reusable materials. Also, we provide visual feedback. Um, the software indicates through labels the area on which the catheter is placed. The system is designed to provide a potential training tool for training professionals in practice of ventriculostomy. At the end of the training, different metrics are collected from the pressure as total time, insertion leg, angle, and linearity. In this table, in this table we can uh, observe the equation of each metric. Also, an experimental test was conducted by two novices with no experience in ventriculostomy. Uh, this consists in locating the catheter in the foramen of Monroe, throat, skull, cranius, and brain. When the catheter was located in the foramen of Monroe, um, the task was completed, and we can see an arrow and, and red uh, uh, arrow that indicates the path that the catheter must uh, follow. We do 16 procedures, and we obtain two graphs. First graph shown the time, and the second graph shown the linearity of insertion. As we can see, the time is very similar at the end and at the beginning procedure. On the other hand, we have an important improve of linearity of the final procedure in contrast with the first one. Also, we obtain the, um, the graph of the catheter path in the three principal views and a 3D, um, 3D graph. Well, nowadays, nowadays, there are various methods for surgical training, direct uh, training on corpses, a model of physical simulations, virtual simulators, and uh, simulators that combine um, the two technologies. Um, we make a comparison between our system and others. Our system use technology of physical model printing in 3D, visual feedback, throw software. Start up in five minutes, and uh, we have some reemplaceable models like scalp, stoma, and brain models. Also, our system um, obtain more metrics than other present in this comparison time, angle, linearity of insertion, and length of insertion. Our system has some advantages like a ventricular system with hydrocephalus, passive markers, reemplaceable models, and visual feedback. Also, we have some limitations like the necessary calibration all the time and the no portability. We are aware that not only are catheter trajectories indispensable for a good ventriculostomy, but we believe that it's, very import it's a very important part. Our system can be used for practice some interventions similar to ventriculostomy, like Omaya Reservoir, and the system provides a risk-free environment for practitioners where they can improve their skills and observe their improvement by recording their their previous uh, trainings. And finally, our conclusions. Surgical training is a very important point for the development of technical skills and abilities of practitioners. For the performance of ventriculostomies, it is important to practice under controlled environments that do not represent any risk for patients or surgeons. A novel training system was developed by combining techniques in image processing and 3D printing. Training systems like ours 
offers opportunities for improvement to surgeons who wish to do under safe conditions. Well, and, uh, that's it uh, for me. Thank you for paying attention. I don't know, some questions? Thank you very much, Mayer, for your presentation. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, please, if any of the attendees would like to make a question, if you want to raise your hand, or you can also make your questions on the chat. Everyone has permissions to open their microphones now. Thank you, Jorge. OK, if you just want to open the microphone and ask your question, it's OK. OK, I don't see anyone, but I would like to ask you, Abimael, what is the next step in this project? OK, the next step is uh, make the the system portable because uh, right now we have a, a very big uh, training bot and um, the next the next step is make more portable and little the training bots and have you uh, asked um, a surgeon to test it yes uh, we uh, realize um, uh, visit to the um, hospital uh, in pediatric hospital of Mexico and uh, we we make some probes where with uh, surgeons uh, very expert surgeons and they um, they uh, give off some some re retroalimentation feedback 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 yeah some feedback and in uh, uh they like a lot of uh, our our project and uh, they think that it's a very very good project for uh, develop the skills and abilities for uh, new surgeons excellent oh well I wish you all uh, success in all your project, Abimael, and thank, thank you very you much for your presentation. Uh, is there anyone that would like to make a question to Abimael? OK, I don't see anyone. Um, OK, well, thank you very much, Abimael. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. For your presentation. Thank you. OK, so let's go to our second presentation. And our second presentation is uh, by Jose Ruben Huerta Osnaya. Please, uh, Jose Ruben, could you please share your presentation? And hello. Can you hear me? Uh, we cannot hear you very well. I can hear you, but very, very low. Um, there, uh, can you hear me a little bit better? A little bit better, yes. I think that's as far as my... Yes, yes, I can hear you very well now, yes. Okay, uh, now can you share your presentation, please? First, uh, there it should be seen now. Excellent, yes. Okay, so let's, uh, I'm going to present you. OK, Jose Ruben Huerta Osnaya is going to present the paper Intra Interpedicular Skew Placement Image Guided Naviga Navigation Surgery Simulator. OK, all yours. Thank you very much. Well, hello, my name is Jose Ruben Huerta, and I will be speaking about the prototype that we developed uh, by the title Interpedicular Skew Placement Image Guided Navigation Surgery Simulator. 
the content of the presentation will be exposed in this point. Uh, with, with an impression, the product description, the test and results, uh, discussion, and finally the conclusions and further work that is planned. If we try to oversimplify the process of the surgery, it consists on drilling a hole on the pedicle of the vertebra, which is this uh, kind of a pallet in the top part of the of the same one, and then placing a screw to through each to such hole in order to fix it to the next vertebra to aid for the general uh, support of the column. This links all the vertebras, especially when they are damaged, either by an accident or by some um, disease in the in the bones. So this surgery it's it's designed to help that that process. Uh, however, the surgery is made inside the bones by itself, and that along with how the human is anatomically in the back part, it makes very difficult to perform the surgery. Usually, all these procedures are made uh, aided by radiography image guided systems, so that the surgeon can let's say see inside the bones while he is uh, operating. Uh, the image guided surgery and specifically those which use radiography based image can be useful uh, to perform process that otherwise will be really difficult or even impossible because they allow us, as, as I say, to, to see inside the bones, to see what, what actually can be seen like this surgery. Uh, the process can also be you know, somehow summarized in taking a shot, uh, showing the current situation, usually is the, the drilling process, then the tool position, the orientation, and then the surgeon makes a move and takes another shot, and the process is repeating itself until it's finished. However, the use of radio, ra, uh, ionizing radiation, it's, uh, it's a risk because it can damage some of the tissues. For the patient, this risk usually is overwhelmed by the fact that, well, he actually needs the surgery. But for all the medical staff, this is not the case. It's a risk without a real benefit. The best way to reduce the risk on, on, on all the medical staff is to reduce the time that they, they take to perform the surgery. Um, by reducing the time, they will use less shots as well. And this is, can only be at, obtained through training, through a lot of training. However, the training represents a risk by itself because it needs, they need to perform the surgery to train, but performing the surgery becomes a risk, so it's like a, a cycle. Therefore, uh, they, the need of a safe training system or a safe training method is necessary. That's where this prototype would be entering. If we jump to the prototype description, it's a, it's a training box with a lumbar model inside and to fix USB webcams in the, in the sites in order to make the image acquisition, as we can see in the first, in the first photo. Uh, here we have the um, modeling and the real situation. And the cameras can acquire the position or an orientation of the tool and also identify what tool they are use, using. And all this information, both graphically and numerically, will be shown in an interface that the surgeon can be can can see in order to perform the, the procedure. We can see the resemblance with the operation room. We are using the real uh, operational tools that they will be using. Now we have the patient simulation. We have the screen that they will be focusing and this will help um, the trainee to get used to the to the three perspective bidimensional visual feedback instead of mm, the real site, let's say and also develop the hand dexterity that will be required for the for the process. If we talk about the lumbar model that we are using, it co includes the coccyx, the spinal dura mater, the intervertebral disc, and lumbar vertebrae 1 to 5. We replace the L3, the third vertebra, by a 3D printed model in order that we could be able to drill holes or break it apart if we need to, or do any kind of test that we need and be able to replace it, both for the testings and for the further for the practice. And we are using the exact same um, tools that they will be using in the operational room. This will give um, the surgeon the, a much more realistic situation in order because they will have the muscular memory to 
for the feeling, let's say, for of the tools, and not like a like a, an interface or a a tool simulator. Then the information in the information is displayed in the interface, as we can see in this image. Uh, it shows the three perspective of the same uh, of the same vertebra, with a graph showing the position and orientation of the tool, also the angle from the lateral and axial view, and the general tool depth, and in the upper part the tool identification. This is because um, for the for the definition that the graph shows. The, it cannot be uh, different. You, they cannot difference between one tool to another, and they have different forms in the in the point. Uh, in the real image, since it's like a radiography, they will see the difference in the point. So we are help, we are helping or compensating that absence of information by a by a marker, a label, let's say. And at the end of the practice, all the all the metrics are saved in an Excel file that it's saved on the computer that they are working on, along with an image with the trajectories that they will be, that they were they followed through the practice from each view and a three-dimensional recreation of the same trajectory. Now for the test and results, uh, we divided into parts. First, we uh, conduct a two major type of conceptual proofs: the color elimination or highlighting and the filtering and image conditioning, and then prototype testings. That was first the, what we call the binarization test, then uh, measurement the prototype accuracy and precision, and the final user testing. For the color elimination or highlight, we applied different color filters to some images that contain all the primary colors, let's say, in order to see the effect of such filters on, on, the, on different patterns, on different objects, and we came to the conclusion that eliminating the, the red color uh, eliminates most of the rest of the colors and also high, automatic, automatically highlights the color blue. Also, we conduct uh, on different objects because we were also trying to, to see if using passive markers or active markers would be better. But since the active markers, markers saturate the, the camera, uh, creating some noise, we came to the, to the conclusion or we decided to use blue passive markers for all the for all the prototype development. I'm sorry. And then for the final image processing, we use a three stage filtering. First, in the first image, we can see the, 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 the photo taken, eliminating the red color. And then we use a, a filtering that let's say boost the images and make every every clear pixel clearer and every dark pixel darker. This creates a little bit of noise on the blue spectrum, but all the pure blue or the uh, calibrated blue objects that we were using were boosted to the saturation level. So when we binaris we binarisate the images, only the what we call pure blue objects will remain, eliminating the rest of the glares, even though some some other like reflections could be shown in, the, for example, the third images. For that, we made uh, we applied a third filter and a smoothing surface smoothing process in order to leave the markers in a clear shape or in a more regular shape from where we can obtain some information. Specifically speaking, the spatial information or the coordinates. The final result was transforming the four images that are on on the left into the binary. Uh, results where only the two markers are shown as a smooth, uh, uh, smooth regular, uh, regular shape. With these coordinates, we can calculate the slope and the position of the endpoint, which will be traduced into the depth and angle of the general tool. In order to test this process or this algorithm, we conduct the testing of um, 100 repetition sets, and after a couple of weeks of daily, daily, daily daily testing the whole prototype, we came to an um, efficiency from about, about above 98%. This we can attribute it to the multi-processing filtering, uh, multi-stage filtering process, and also the aid from the background that we painted in red with, with some like background panels in order to avoid noise. And what well, in this particular shot is not shown, but we also paint the, the, the tools 
to avoid any other residual noise. Uh, once calculated position and orientation, the two in the in the two acquired perspectives, we take advantage that we are watching the same point and the, the lengths are not changing. And we could generate a third view that would be the superior view. Uh, and we can see in these images how we only had to transmit the the distances from the two perspectives to the third one. And we can show the information in the three, three perspective graphs. These graphs are only visual A. They give us a general location reference, but here we did not, it's, it's not here where we calculate the accuracy and precision. For that, what we did was to fix the tool in different, um, in different, in different depths that we measure by handling measure and compare those real measures to the measure that was showed in the, in the program, in the interface. Uh, with that, we came to a variation of three degrees in the angle, which was acceptable. And it had a seven to nine millimeters variation in the depth that was not acceptable. But since we saw that it was a constant uh, difference, we only had to apply an offset to the calculations and therefore the variation um, end up in more or less one millimeter, which was uh, acceptable. For the final user testing, we, the program was exported to an XFTBL file that could be installed in any computer with uh, at least four gigabytes of RAM, one gigabyte for the of space for installation, two USB ports for the cameras, and we only test it on Windows, but um, we are looking forward to see if it works on other operational systems, but at least for Windows, it worked okay in Windows 7, 10, and 9, I think. We see in both the as in the inefficiency predicted, the successful and, fa and failed test uh, um, screens. We can see a little illustration of the of the pro uh, of the prototype. We put some markers on the tool in order to have a visual reference of what they are, uh, are we expecting. This was only made for the demonstration and. They were made by hand, and it was the test was made by me. So even if, if we do not see much variation, probably in the in the site because it's it's on, on a almost fit hole, uh, we'll see in the end that the trajectory or the measurements perceived by the by the prototype are quite variable compared to the ideal ideal situation. Uh, we can see how the depth is changing, how it's, uh, it's uh, identifying the, the same, well, we are using the same tool for all this, for this test or for this demonstration, but we can see how it identifies and how the graphs are moving along with the, which is shot that we are taking. Well, at the end of, of the practice, the, the, all the data will be saved in an Excel file. It's not shown in, in the screen, but it will be saved on the computer. What I will be showing just is the, the graphs generated. Um, there they are. Here we can see that even though in the view, we do not see much variation in the real or in the reality or in the measurement, we can see a lot of, a lot of my faults uh, affecting the measurements. Uh, finally, for discussion, we can say that we reached to a portable surgery simulator and based on passive motion tracking with two USB, USB webcams as image sensors and has an accuracy of two millimeters and about six degrees and a general efficiency of 95%, taking every test in, in accountants and using real surgery tools with anatomically accurate spin recreation. And for the specifications, we could identify some of these ones, like um, the fact of that we are measurement two angles, only one depth, but we have three perspectives. We can identify the tool. We had a six to eight seconds delay between shots, which what which we consult with some um, surgeons, and they were, they so they say that it was in the in the okay range, even though we are trying to reduce it. And the report of the trajectories and metrics for a. Uh, for a, for a more, much more objective uh, evaluation. Use these um, characteristics 
to compare it to some other prototypes that are out in the market right now. And we can see that in some of them we, we uh, match it or even outpass it. This doesn't mean or it's not implying that the prototype is better because one of the major problems for any simulator in any area is the fact that we can neither control everything or keep, nor keep it everything real. Because as much as we control something, we have to um, eliminate the realistic, um, the realistic variations or the realistic unpredictably. And at the same part, if we're trying to keep it the more real thing, we cannot control it. For example, in the first one, you have an act app interface, but in order to have so, it needs to be a fixed workstation. And the second one, or the third one, I'm sorry, it has the most realistic pony models. But since they are so realistic, they cannot be measured some things such as the trajectory or the depth, and it's only a subject evaluation. Or having a computer simulation, which makes a much more immersive virtual reality situation, but at the same time, it doesn't make any acquisition. It's always a perfect uh, surgery, let's say. As conclusions for further work, uh, we can see that in general, the simulators for any situation have to deal with the dilemma of having to wave between keep the situation as real as and unpredictable as possible or getting the most controlled but unrealistic situation. This particular situation where the objective is to lower the risk, the need of realistic but measurable practice is crucial. This work pretends to get a, a middle point, narrowing down, narrowing down what points we can remain realistic and what points we can remain controlled, and the results uh, gives background for further research and making technical improvement to the prototype and for the validation. That's for the further work. The immediate next step is to improve the prototype, but by optimizing the image processing algorithm, we pretend to reduce the time between shots, making it able to, multiple, to work on multiple vertebrae at the same time, because that's what the surgery will ultimately do. Show more metrics like the time between shots, the, all the general trajectory speed, because that's the, what the, the, one of the variables that we are trying to reduce, what well, the training will be trying to reduce. And um, probably uh, a, a better or much more um, compar comparable report after the work. And finally, include some more bony resembling models because we were using only the 3D printing uh, material. And with that, we could be able to make a validation for the training system to prove its efficiency in academic specs. That will be everything from my part. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Jose Ruben, for your presentation. Okay. Uh, we have time for a few questions. If you would like to make a questions, uh, any of the attendees, please, you can just open your microphone. You can raise your hand or uh, you can write your um, question on the chat, please. OK, well, I don't see any question now. Uh, Jose Ruben, I have a question. Uh, as a final equipment, this um, what would be the requirements of the equipment that uh, you need? The final requirements. The final requirements. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, on what, like for the, for example, for the capacity of processing or display memory, uh, all the requirements that you need in order to carry out all the uh, procedure. Okay, well, currently the execu executable file that we developed uh, needs at least uh, four gigabytes of RAM in the computer using, uh, which is not much, but it um, it extends a little bit the time between shots. Uh, on the computer, the, on the best computer we proved it, it had about 16 gigabytes of RAM. We could reduce it just by plugging it in to three to four seconds degree. So seconds delay. I'm sorry, between shots. But we are using um, kind of a redundant algorithm. So we are trying to make an optimization of for the code in order to well, make it faster without the needing of much more resources. 
Okay, and compared to the uh, other uh, work that you presented, comparing your project, um, do you know the characteristics of the other uh, projects? Yes, uh, we made a, well, it, it's only uh, re paper research, but mm -hmm. we made a research with a uh, com comparison research with about eight to eight to twelve. I don't I don't really remember it, eight to twelve similar projects and mm -hmm. um, we are in the range from all okay. of them. Mm -hmm. Excellent. OK, very interesting your work, Jose Ruben. Thank you very much. Any question from the attendees, please? I have a question. Yes, please go on. Uh, is it possible to use uh, these uh, for other kind of surgeries? And the principle, yes. Uh, the simulator by itself, not really, because on the interface it shows literally the, the vertebra. But the principle of the image acquisition, uh, the all the all the process, yes, it could be applied to um, almost any other surgery with the certain basis that is using tomography or fluoroscopy as guided system. Thank you. Thank you. OK, well, uh, we have to pass to the next presentation. Thank you very much, Jose Ruben, for your presentation. OK, uh, let's go to our third presentation today, and it's uh, by Carla Itzel Suarez Perez. Uh, please, uh, Carla, can you share your presentation? And let's test if we can hear you correctly. OK, yes. I can see you, Carla. We can hear you. Excellent. Okay. Now, yes, excellent. We can hear you. Now your presentation. Excellent. It's coming. OK, can you see the presentation and can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. OK, let me introduce you. OK, uh, Carla Itzel Sores Perez is going to present the paper Anisotropy Properties of Chicken Muscle Tissues with Bioimpedance Measurements via AD5933EB set. It's all yours, Carla. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. My name is Carla Itzel Suarez Perez, and I'm going to present you the paper called Anisotropy Properties of Chicken Muscle Tissues with Bioimpedance Measurements via AD5933 EVC. This work was developed in collaboration with the Instituto Politecnico Nacional and Universidad Nacional de Tierra de Fuego. Well, let's go start. The content of this presentation is as follows. In the, in the introduction, we're going to talk about what is the bioimpedance, the type of measurements, some applications, and what is the anisotropy. Uh, in the methodology, we're going to talk about the samples, the experimental protocol, the instrumentation, the data analysis, result, discussion, and the conclusion. Well, first, what is the bioimpedance? Bioimpedance is a property of the tissues, of the muscles, bones, organs, and other human body components. And we can describe it as a parameter that quantifies the opposition to the flow of an alternative electrical current in a biological system. Also, we can define it as the relationship between the voltage and the electric current that is the ohm's law. Also, the impedance is represented by a complex number, and it has two parts the real part, which has a resistive component, and the imaginary part that has a reactive component, as we can see in the equation. Several applications for bioimpedance measurements can be divided into three primary fields uh, according to the type of measurements, and they are single frequency, electrical impedance spectroscopy, and electrical impedance tomography. And in this work, a spectroscopy study is present. In this one, the sample is analyzed in a vein which uh, performing a frequency sweep. These electrical bioimpedance applications have impacted 
the medical, the agricultural and food fields. For example, like the study or cardiovascular parameters and the composition of different tissues. Also in the evaluation of diseases in areas such as obstetrics, intensive care, traumatology, also in the distinction of plantation against climate change and the differentiation of refrigerated food. And there are some examples. The bioimpedance values depends on the characteristics. Ah, sorry, depends on the characteristics and composition of the different tissues. Also, because of the morphology of the logical system, there can be variations in their electrical properties. That's why, by measuring bioimpedance, different characteristics of healthy or pathological systems can be identified. For example, this is an electrical impedance to evaluate skin lesions and detect melanomas. The above characteristics are described by the anisotropy, which is the general property of the medium according to which its physical properties vary regarding on the direction in which they are examined. In bioimpedance, knowing the anisotropy of electrical properties is of interest. For example, in the human body, the anisotropy can be seen in muscular, skeletal or striated tissues, as well as in the composition of bones. In the skeletal muscle, for example, the bioimpedance is determined by the orientation of the muscle fibers and in mid, to say, to say it another example, the electrical properties vary regarding on the direction in which the electrodes are arranged. For this reason, in some tissues, the change of the direction in the fibers in the internal structure, the pathologies can be detected. Exist devices that can perform this kind of measurements but in general, they are expensive, not portable and wired. For this reason, the design or improvement of new devices that can measure by impedance in any circumstance is of the interest to biomedical and electrical engineers. In this contribution, we showed that an integrated circuit can be used to take by impedance measurements at low cost. This is the integrated circuit and its name is 8059TD3 that is a high precision impedance converted system that contains different components, but the result of the process will be a real and imaginary value for each excitation frequency. This circuit is, is from analog devices and we can found we can found it in different evaluation boards. For, for example, this one, that this evaluation board that it, its name is eval 8059 33 offers a graphic use interface that we can see in the left picture for the communication with a computer that allows configuring values and obtaining results for the, imper for the um, impedance measurements that we carry out. We use this evaluation board in this work to correlate by impedance measurements with anisotropy of the medium, and this consists of measuring by impedance a different electrode position in chicken breast tissues, taking different samples. But now, how we did it? Well, first, for the measurement process, the applied electric current reaches the biological environment through copper wires and electrodes connect to the body or to the surface to measure by impedance, as we can see in the left picture. And in the right picture, we can see the model of a particular conflict called electrolyte electrode interface. And here, the arranged electrons for the applied signal are converted to ions to transport the electric current over the biological medium and vice versa. And this phenomenon turns impedance measured as a contact point between the electrode and the biological sim and the biological system. Now we want to talk about our samples or what kind of samples we used. The employed samples consist of 10 fresh chicken breasts without prior freezing 
acquired in the local market and the measurements were performed on the same day that we bought the chicken. These chicken breasts were kept at a room temperature for two hours before we take the measurements. And in each sample, two geometric lines were established the crosswise and the lengthwise lines that we can see in the diagram. Uh, the first line is considered transverse to the tissue fibers and is located along the maximum section in that direction. And we mention the reference A to F to identify the points and a reference electrode was placed and the second was moved away from the mentioned points. And the second line uh, is located at the orthogonal point in the self same lengthwise direction at a proportional distance of approximately 40% of the maximum proximal crosswise distance corresponding to the points uh, J, F to J. And in this case, two electrodes were placed equidistant from the lengthwise line on the crosswise one. Uh, for each measurement, we took three continuous measurements. And the measurements were performed in the two lines, lengthwise and crosswise direction, to correlate the bioimpedance values and the muscle fibers and isotropy. I think we lost Carla. Yes, she's present. Okay, let me see. Yes, I think maybe she has a problem, a technical problem. So let's wait for a few uh, seconds to see if, if she solves the problem. Okay. Uh, we cannot hear her, um, Cesar. Okay, no. they are trying to contact her. Please, let's wait a few seconds. Let's see if we can solve the problem. In the meantime, could the next speaker raise your hand? I see to Maria Fernanda. Uh -huh. Aha, it's Maria Fernanda Romo who is going to present. Okay. Thank you, Maria Fernanda. Uh Okay, if anyone knows what is going on with Carla, please. Uh, because maybe we can pass to the next and uh, allow her to finish at the end of the at uh, the end of all the presentations. Mm, okay, it's internet. Uh, okay, uh, Daniel, yes, please. Uh, Daniel wants to speak. Uh, Jorge, can we allow Daniel to speak, please? Yes, you can speak, Daniel. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Carla is going to continue but with my session. Excellent. So you're going to share your screen? Okay. Uh -huh. okay, okay, I think we can continue.
Okay, so if you are ready, Carla. Uh, yes. Excellent. Technical problems as always. <laughs> okay, no problem. Please continue. Well, uh, did you hear me until this point? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, as I said, we use an evolution board, but before carrying out the measurement, uh, we calibrate the board and we use the set of values that are shown in the table. Uh, it's important to mention that this evaluation board uh, allows a bipolar configuration in the measurements. So we use just two electrodes, the inject sig signal and the measure signal I carry out by the same two electrodes and the evaluation board was connected via USB to a PC and the software provided by the manufacturer controls the board and the same software allows download each measurement. We can see the, the software in the number one in the right picture and we can see the electrodes in number five and number six. Mm. Well, now our results. Well, first, the methodology for the proposed experiment can be validated with graphics of the impedance model behavior versus the frequency shift. And it's important to mention that a model is manually calculated from the impedance that we obtain to present our results. These graphics show the bioimpedance behavior across the frequency shift. And here, a fixed distance between the electrodes was selected at four centimeters for both experiment. And we can observe that the impedance model decreases in magnitude as the applied frequency increases. This fact allows concluding that beyond any systematic error, the obtaining measurements correspond to the profile of a bioimpedance system, thus the proposed methodology can be assumed correct. Now for another measurement, uh, for equidistant frequencies, we're select to analyze them. And we analyze them at approximately 25, 50, 75, and 100 kilohertz. And these are some these are some figures of the acquired data. This selection of the frequency was made to avoid low frequencies because the electrolyte electrode interface effect can occur at low frequencies. And in other words, the present work intends to obtain measurements that characterize the tissue and not the measurement interface. So, to characterize the data, an appropriate curve fitting is proposed for the measurement. For the crosswise measurements data, we obtain impedance values that present a quadratic para parabolic behavior, and which is correlated with regulation coefficients that we shown in the in this table. We can see that the media of the correlation coefficient is near to one where one represents that exists a uh, dependence of the data. And for the language measurement, we also can see that the media of the correlation coefficients are near to one that also represent, where also one represents a perfect linear dependence and zero that a linear relationship between the data doesn't exist. So we can conclude in these cases that, for example, the lengthwise measurement, uh, as the distance between the electrodes increases, the impedance values increases. And in, on the other hand, in the crosswise measurement, we observe uh, a convex curve, and we have a maximum value at around the distance of three centimeters. And also we can observe that the impedance values in lengthwise measurements were higher than those obtained on the measurements of 
from crosswise. So, well, considering different things, for example, that the pH of the sample remains constant, that the room temperature doesn't change, and that we use the same electrodes, we can conclude that the only reason of a variation of a impedance is the anisotropy of the tissue. So the present method shown the anisotropy in the tissue by means of a flexible low cost and low power consumption element. Two, allowing the possibility uh, of quantifying by impedance without using ionizing radiation or image generation. Also, the present work considered this biomedical experiment as a first approach to the anisotropic characterization of chicken or turkey tissues. Also, we can use this kind of methods in the industry, for example, in the refrigerated food. And finally, the, the present contribution established a beginning to determine the anisotropy in striated muscles in vitro based on the impedance using a low cost bar. And that's all. Thanks for your attention. If you have any questions. Thank you very much for the presentation. And we have a que at time for a question only. If anyone out of the attendees would like to make a question, please. You can just open your microphone or write on the chat. Yes, I, I have a question. Go on, please. Uh, good presentation. Thank you. Uh, my, my question is where can I use this information for cooking, for example, and what application? Well, you can use this kind of information, for example, to correlate when a tissue is healthy and when you have a pathological tissue. For example, if you can observe that in your measurements you have a different, uh, different kind of data, for example, if, if you have a, pertur a perturbation, it means that in the tissue something is wrong. For example, if you measure, like in this case, for example, in the in the lengthwise line, we observe uh, that the data that the data correspond to a linear trend. So if you are waiting for a linear trend and you obtain like a parabolic trend or a different kind of line, it means that something is happening in your sample of in your experiment or in your experiment. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Carla, for your presentation and your answers. Um, because of the time, we have to pass to the next presentation. Thank you very much, Carla. You're welcome. OK, our next presentation is by Maria Fernanda Romo Fuentes. Um, Maria Fernanda, could you please share your presentation? Yes. Um, hey. Excellent, we can see you. OK, excellent. OK, let me introduce your paper. OK, Maria Fernanda is going to present the paper ICTAL periods detection in photoplethysmographic and electrodermal signals. It's all yours, Mafer. OK, uh, good afternoon. Today I will give you an overview of the paper we developed called ICTAL periods detection in photoplethysmographic and electrodermal signals. First, a brief introduction. Epilepsy is defined by the International League Against Epilepsy as a disease characterized by the continuous disposition to the occurrence of epileptic crisis and by the biological, cognitive, social, and psychological consequences given by this, by this disease. In turn, an epileptic crisis can be defined 
as the transitory apparition of signs or symptoms derived from the abnormal, synchronous, or excessive neural activity in the brain. Uh, the gold standard for the detection of epileptic crisis is through the analysis of the leak signal. But this is this limits the continuous monitoring of epileptic patients. Therefore, it is proposed that we can identify these periods of epileptic crisis uh, called ICTAL periods through the analysis of signals acquired through a wearable device that are derived from the control of the autonomous nervous system. Re reminding that the autonomous nervous system has effects when an epileptic crisis occurs. In this uh, project, we analyzed two signals. The first is heart rate variability obtained uh, from photoplethysmography and the electrothermal signal obtained uh, through the galvanic skin response. Uh, these are the materials, uh, the signals we studied. We uh, analyzed 11 recordings belonging to the epilepsy database in the instrumentation and signal processing laboratory in Upita. These 11 recordings are composed by six signals that were acquired simultaneously during an epileptic tri uh, trigger identifying session under the supervision of a specialist. Uh, the first is electroencephalography. This signal we will use it in our, well, you will see it, but we use it to obtain the tags for the training of the system. And these five signals are acquired through the Empatica E4 device, which is a wearable device with this mark. And uh, these signals are accelerometry, temperature, uh, photoplethysmography, electrothermal activity, and interbit interval. These last two signals are the ones that we will analyze. And the ages of the patients are in a range of 1 to 27 years. And the mean duration of all the recordings are 40 minutes, approximately. At the methodology. First, we obtained the tags. Uh, we did it separately for training and for testing, since in, to the, during the development of this project, we found that an epileptic crisis may have effects that vary in time. They can be short or they can be long. So we had to find a method in which we could train the model uh, to better characterize the digital and interictal periods. So for training, we have the crisis vector. This vector is obtained uh, through the analysis of the electroencephalographic signal, as I mentioned. And the methodology we used is uh, in the reference section, if someone wants to check it out, it's the number 13. So we have the crisis vector, the EDA and HRV signals, and the recording starting time. This is important uh, since we tie it in time so that they can start and end at the same time. So the tags correspond to the segment properly. And then we identify the ICTAL period, and we tag uh, as ICTAL or as one, one to five minutes after the start of a crisis, and we tag as interictal or as zero, namely a period in which we do not have an epileptic crisis, one to five minutes before the start of a crisis. And for testing, we have the pretty much the same at the beginning, but then the crisis vector is segmented in the exact same way in which we segment the EDA and HRV signals in terms of the window length and the slide. And then we analyze the segment and we apply this rule. First, if in the segment there's at least one crisis, we tag it as ICTAL. And if the segment there's no crisis, we tag it as interictal. And the feature extraction, this is also done separately for training and for testing. For training, we just uh, extract features for the segments that were previously identified as ICTAL and interictal. And for testing, we have for EDA first an artifact correction, and then we segment the signal considering one to five minute windows with three to 60 seconds slide. And this is the extracted features in the time and frequency domain. And for HRV, it's pretty much done the same for training and for testing. We do not need to make an artifact correction since the uh, Empatica E4 device automatically, automatically eliminates the artifacts, the segments in which it finds artifacts. And then we segment the signal considering three to five minute windows length. And 30 and 60 second slides. And then we extract these features that are listed here in the time and the frequency domain. And for training, uh, we use three kinds of data processing. The first is only with uh, the training of the model with just normalization of the data per feature, per patient, 
The second is considering normalization plus principal component analysis so that we only maintain the features that better characterize ictal and interictal periods. And the last one is normalization plus PCA plus bagging done separately for ictal and interictal. This was applied since we know that we do not have that much information uh, for the recordings. We only have 11 recordings and they have a mean duration of 40 minutes. And then we segmented all the recordings uh, considering windows that go from one to five minutes. So we do not have that much that much information. So we tried applied bagging so that we generate artificial data for both uh, categories, ictal and interictal. So at the end, we have a uh, models that we trained and tested. There are 75 for EDA in the time and frequency domain, considering uh, the, th the three kind of data process and the five window lengths and the five slides. And for HRV, we have 18 models each, considering two, the three kind of data process, the three windows and the two slides. Now the results. First, this is the architecture of our neural network. Uh, the model was trained by scale conjugate gradient backpropagation, and the hidden layers have an activation function of logarithmic sigmoid, and the output is a softmax function. And in this uh, table, we can see the number of hidden layers that, are, uh, that work the best for each kind of training model, for each length, for each signal, for each domain and a little bit of a spoiler, but the one that works best in, for a project was four minutes in window length. So in here we highlight the number of hidden layers that work best for the training models. And to better, uh, to determine the window length, the slide and the type of training model, we used uh, two metrics. The first is accuracy, reminding that accuracy is the overall efficiency of the training model. And with accuracy, we found that the model that works best is what we segment using four minutes uh, window length. And the slide uh, does not improve or worsen the results. Therefore, uh, we chose to use 30 seconds since it's the smallest slide that we can use for both signals in both domains. And we use recall. Uh, recall gives us how many of the identified ICTAL periods were actually ICTAL. And with recall, we found that the type of training model that works best for EDA in both domains and HRV is normalization plus principal component analysis. And for HRV in the time domain is normalization plus PCA plus packing. And this is the decision rule for the neural network output. Uh, first, we compare the signals in both domains. If the outputs are different, we give preference to the frequency output for both signals, since uh, in general, the frequency domain output gave the results with more consistency. And then we compare these two, and if the output is different, we give preference to the data frequency domain output, since uh, all the tests uh, show that this signal gives uh, the results with the highest metric evaluations with more consistency. These are the average metric evaluations of the classification model. Accuracy of 25.15%, recall really high of 97.49%, specificity of 0.44%, precision of 24.86%, and an F2 score of 60.12%. And uh, in specific, uh, the recall and specificity metrics takes us to the following conclusions. First, the ICTAL classification efficiency is overall of 97%, but uh, this metric in a specific specificity is real since the system uh, has problems classificating ICTAL periods, and this is due to the to factors such as pathology severity, patient's age, or crisis severity affect the duration of pre-ICTAL or post-ICTAL periods. So we could not uh, properly characterize uh, interictal periods. Uh, then, uh, principal component analysis improved all the classification models, and uh, we could not use just one neural network for the classification, since uh, the classification models that work best for each domain for each signal uh, differ, number of neurons and number of hidden layers, so we could not use just one neural network for classification. And we also did a 
comparisons with other classification methods, these being tree bagger and super vector machine, but in general, neural networks uh, show the best results. And this is our recommendation to better uh, characterize interactive periods. We recommend uh, analysis of long duration recordings. These are the references for the pref uh, for this uh, presentation. And the number 13 that we see here is the paper that we use to uh, the methodology we use to analyze it. And thank you for your attention. OK, thank you very much, uh, Maria Fernanda, for your presentation. Is there any question from the attendees, please? I, I can see a hand. Uh, yes, Luis Brian, please. Yes, hello, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yes, I have a question according to the electrodermal activity. Uh, mm -hmm. To analyze this signal, uh, what technique, uh, what is the technique that you use to know the different changes? Uh, that is, you have to analyze the basic component or the tonic component, or is a mix between those components? No, we just analyze the the rapid, the fast, the tonic, basic. The FASIC, yes, thank you. Yes, just that one. Because it shows the, well, when you have an epileptic crisis, the changes are supposed to be really fast. Well, the break time period may start uh, with the difference in time, but we, to, uh, to characterize the time periods, we just focus on the fast changes of the signal. Okay, and uh, how, well, what, what is the difference of uh, the changes? I, let me let me think the, the question because it's a complex question according to the comparison between the EEG analysis that you can uh, do and the analysis that you can do with the electrodermal activity. What are the difference between our signal in comparisons uh, in in time in terms of time? For example, oh, okay. if, you, if you have a, a crisis in EEG, what is the difference in a EDA recording? Okay, yes. Uh, the changes that we can see then in the electroencephalographic signal are really fast since uh, the measurement is, well, just in the place that the epileptic crisis starts and occurs, right? Uh, but uh, the in terms of analysis of the signals that are controlled by the autonomous nervous system, the changes uh, take their time. They can be fast because in the electrodermal activity signal, it's relatively fast, but still it may take time. So precisely that was the fact uh, that, I don't know if you saw, but we separate the training and the tax obtainment in a specific for training and for testing since uh, we were looking in specific for the segments that we could make sure that uh, present ictal and interictal uh, characteristics because yeah the changes can be fast or slow depending precisely of the factors of the patient and the epileptic crisis okay perfect well thank you for, for your answer thank you thank you luis brian any other question from the attendees please Okay, I don't see any other question. So thank you very much, Maria Fernanda, for your presentation. And you. let's go to the next one, please. Okay, our next presentation is by Rosario Rios Prado. Rosario, could you please uh, share your presentation? Uh, sure. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, can you tell me please if you are saying my screen, please? Yes, we can see yes. Ah, okay. Yes. 
So I will be. Uh, I, uh, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rosario Rios, and I will present uh, this paper uh, that is called Artifacts Removal in Electrodermal Signals. Uh, this uh, pro project or uh, paper is made uh, with the collaboration of the supervisors, supervisors uh, Laura uh, Garay and Blanca Tobar Corona. And we designed an algorithm to remove artifacts in electrodermal signals. Um, the intention of this paper is to separate the tonic and the phasic responses. And also, uh, uh, as the same uh, told, told us, uh, is uh, remove the artifacts in, in this kind of signals. Um, well, uh, as we know, uh, electrodermal activity is a mesh is a measure of changes in the electrical conductance of the skin. So in this case, we have a response that is a highly sensitive physiological measure uh, of the skin. And in this way, we are uh, the responses as we can see in the figure. Uh, when we have uh, external stimuli, we can see two signals that are um, components of the electrodermal activity. So in this figure, we can see uh, the signal that is the purple signal, and the green signal is the tonic response that is uh, about a, a slow move, a slow changes in the EDA. So then also we have the phasic uh, signal or response that is uh, related to the fast uh, changes in the in the conductance of the skin. So uh, this paper uh, has different objectives. Uh, the first one is uh, analyze the EDA signal with methods of um, biological processing and noisy removing, and also uh, to generate a generic algorithm to remove artifacts. Uh, finally, in the process of this algorithm, we found that tonic and phasic uh, responses can be separate to see the, the changes that we want to, to, to obtain and to analyze. Well, uh, this project uh, works with a database that we have uh, where was where where <laughs> recordings was taken of uh, 20 volunteers and uh, we use in this um, in this project the e4 bracelet that uh, record the the analysis and another signals as b BVP, uh, acceleration, hair rate, uh, EV, and temperature. So this uh, database is a collaboration and construction of the laborat uh, of the UPITA, a uh, LIPS laboratory. And um, well, I, I will explain the algorithm. Uh, in this case, we have five uh, essential steps that we can we to get that they together uh, work in uh, works to remove artifacts in the same uh, in the first step and in the last step we make the the composition so well uh, this algorithm uh, consists of five steps the first one is the standardization where we uh, want to find the outliers in all or in our signals, and then uh, we apply a filtering. In this case, we mm, found or we want to uh, found uh, differences uh, between a median filter and a mean filter. So in this step, um, we found the most uh, relevant changes in the in the signals. Uh, the Step three is the standardization. Uh, in this step, also we uh, want to to found uh, some uh, some changes that are very important for us. 
So, uh, well, with the examples, it, it will be more clearly. Uh, and then when we found the, the most relevant changes in this part, we get a tag of these um, changes and finally we apply the decomposition uh, to get the tonic and phasic signals. Well, in this, in this part, um, we have an example of the algorithm and well, as we say, uh, we have the standardization. In this uh, kind of signals, we have many changes that are different between persons. So, for example, in the figure two, we have an example where the signal along time is a very, where the, the changes are very slow and we can see uh, some peaks that are representative in these signals. So in this part, we have um, a green circle uh, where we can see the, the, these uh, outliers. So for example, uh, in, this, in the first figure, I have three outliers. And in the first step, I, I was looking for uh, the outliers that are um, very different to the old signal. So uh, the algorithm detects the the more the most relevant uh, changes in in the origin of the signal, and in many cases also it detects the changes it at the end of the signal. But uh, these changes are very representative in in this part when we have a high frequency uh, artifacts. Um, for example, in this case, uh, we can see that only we only have uh, one peak uh, where the standardization, the first standardization doesn't work. But uh, this is the reason why we apply the, the, in the third step, the second standardization. Uh, so, well, the, the first standardization is to, to find uh, some peaks uh, along the signal, but the second step, filtering, is used to get the, the most uh, important changes between two mean filters. So with the first uh, filter, mean filter, we are um, looking for uh, for signals that are very representative, but uh, when it changes uh, with the data uh, before or after, but the changes are uh, um, are used with the with the mean. So well, we use a medium filter to to get a, a smooth signal of the of the EDA uh, signal. So well. Uh, in this part, we can see with the filtering and uh, getting the difference between uh, these two filters, we can see uh, high changes that are selected here. But for example, in, in the second case, uh, in the figure three, we can see uh, this difference between median and mean filter are better uh, considering the, the kind of signal. So in this part, this filtering is is um, is less representative to uh, to us because uh, in this case we have just a uh, one chain that uh, are greater than another ones. So uh, for example, in this in this case we can select many many peaks that are different and inconsist uh, of the others. So for example, uh, well. When we analyze this kind of signal, uh, we can uh, consider two main steps in this part where these peaks are very important for us, but uh, in this step, we remove all the peaks that we need to, uh, to delay or remove. Um, well, uh, in this, in this, uh, these two, uh, kinds of signals, we can see the the detection in this part, and uh, where the active artifacts were 
uh, remove it. So uh, in this figure, we can see uh, the, the final signal was also removed, but the, the amplitude in this part, uh, in these peaks, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, smaller than, than the other one. So, well, uh, in this part is the, part, the, the first steps to remove artifacts, but the second part is the, the form to, to found a tonic and facet responses. And for example, uh, in this part, we use a uh, algorithm that is a empirical mode decom decomposition, which we use to, to get uh, different components of the signal. And it is useful for us because it contains the high frequencies or the low frequencies to, to get the, the responses of the signal. So this part uh, is uh, useful when we want to compare the the high frequencies that as we as I say uh, the high frequency is the changes of the external stimuli and the tonic response is related to to uh, slow changes uh, so in this part we have a uh, two different signals two outputs that uh, are the tonic response and the phasic response. And well, we can see different uh, results with the with different kind of signals. For example, in, in this figure, we can see um, high frequencies uh, where it could be related with the external stimuli that in this case was a, a auditive uh, stimuli. So the the changes are, are very are very uh, contrasted to the to the second example. For example, uh, in this case uh, we have uh, another example of signal, but in this case uh, the artifacts are very visible for us. So. Uh, we need to remove these artifacts before apply the algorithm of, of the the composition. So in this part, we have the the comparison between the signal without artifacts and the signal with artifacts. So the first one uh, is uh, very evident that we have an a signal that the where the artifacts are very um, very high, so we can see the, the effect of the external stimuli. In this case, uh, it's like the first case where we have a, a response of the changes uh, where the external stimuli are very uh, are visible. So uh, in this case, we can see the applying the algorithm uh, we can separate the signals, but the changes are, are not uh, different between the, the algorithm of the remove uh, artifacts and without the, the algorithm. So with this algorithm, we can see uh, different um, results. Uh, this algorithm is a simple algorithm that consists of filtering, smoothing, and noisy removing. And in this case, we use uh, the standardization in two parts of the algorithm to remove the artifacts, but they are different kinds of, of artifacts. Uh, artifacts were are in the in the beginning of the signal and also along the signal. So well, when we are, we are analyzing the the EDA signal, we can see different responses. So in this case, um, we can observe that the standardization in every every step is different, and the result of the remove the artifacts uh, acts different too. So well, uh, an important part of this algorithm is the combination of the methods. Uh, we don't use a complex algorithm or a complex um, a complex uh, process to to 
separate the signals or to remove the, the signals. So this algorithm is very, uh, ha has a, a high efficiency. So, well, we have the first approximation to separate the phasic and the tonic signals into signals that um, can show information about the external stimuli or about the, the, the uh, natural response of the skin. And well, finally, uh, we found uh, that this algorithm can be used to separate signals, but uh, at the beginning, we uh, was looking for just an artifact removal algorithm. So in this part, we can see that the uh, the algorithm works uh, works fine. Uh, and finally, uh, an important thing of this algorithm is that the amplitude uh, of the signals of the as input of the algorithm. Uh, is not relevant to, to apply the algorithm. So in, uh, in the examples, we have um, different amplitudes of the signals and it's obvious that uh, everyone has a different response of the skin. So in this part, uh, the amplitude is uh, not a relevant uh, parameter. So we can analyze a different person and different signal with a good results of the separation and good, with 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 go, good results on the uh, artifact removals. And um, well, here I present some uh, biography uh, about the the EDA, and uh, you can consult this information. And um, well, if you have uh, questions, uh, you can uh, write to to my supervisors, uh, Laura Garay and Blanca Tovar. And uh, well, my email is also here. <laughs> and that's that's it. Um, um, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Rosario, for your presentation. Do we have any question from the attendees, please? I don't see any question. Uh, I have a question, Rosario. Yes. Uh, uh, why do you have to develop an algorithm to remove these kind of artifacts or noise? Uh, why not using a filter, a simple filter? Uh, well, um, when we have a simple filter, uh, we try to remove the, the artifacts, but the filter works in the way that uh, we can remove just uh, a band of frequencies, for example. And well, we apply a, a wavelet fil uh, a wavelet process uh, of filtering. But uh, we found that the signal uh, has different responses. Uh, we don't have a uh, well. The signal is a uh, slow change. Uh, the, its frequency is very, uh, very uh, low. It's uh, four hertz. So when we try to apply a, a, a filter, uh, we have um, we remove uh, different frequencies, but it could be related with external stimuli. So we don't have. We don't want uh, to lose information about the signal. Uh, also, with the wavelets, uh, we have uh, at, the, at the end of the process uh, the formation of the signal. And we don't need uh, the, the formation of the signal, but we need just um, try to, to, to lose some frequencies, but not all frequencies. Uh, artifacts are uh, due to different um, different uh, process. Uh, in our case, uh, they are not we related with, um, L, for example, with 60 hertz, but they are related with a movement or something like that. So, well, when we try to to 
apply just a simple filtering. We don't have the results we want, uh, trying to get the, the artifacts uh, because they are they don't work uh, my well if they works linearly or not but they are not uh, useful with the kind of, of artifacts we need to remove okay thank you very much rosario for your presentation and your question and your, sorry, your answer thank you very much thank uh, you because of the time, we have to continue with our next presentation. Thanks, Rosario. Thank you. See you. See you. Uh, OK, we have to continue with Jose Alberto Garcia Limón, please. Excellent, Jose Alberto. OK, Jose Alberto is going to present the Paper prototype of an ambulatory long term ECG monitoring system for real time detection of QRS complex anti wave and based on an FPGA. Dr. Young, can you hear me? Yes. yes, we can. And we can see your presentation too. Okay, thank you. Hi, afternoon to everyone. I'm going to present the, this work title Prototype of an ambulatory long term ECG monitoring for real-time detection of the QRX complex and the T-wave end based on FPGA. The collaborators are Jose Alberto Garcia Limón, Frank Martinez Suarez, and Carlos Alvarado. We are from the uh, Bioelectronic Section, Department of the Electrical Engineer in Simbestap uh, in Mexico City. According to the World Health Organization, cardiovascular disease are the leading cause of death in Mexico and worldwide. To face this public uh, health problem, non-invasive techniques such as an <clears throat> electrocardiogram has been developed to evaluate alteration in the conduction system of the hair. Despite this, certain types of arrhythmias are not always visible <clears throat> in records taken at rest. Okay. Uh, the monitor halter allows ambulatory ECG monitoring for a prolonged period of time while the patients perform daily activities. Since the first uh, prototype designed by Norman Holter, the monitor Holter has evolved as a result of technological advances. The principal advances are number of leads that are related to the acquisition circuit, the processing of the signal that it consists in the extraction of characteristics, and the storing technology. One important element that is not mentioned in this graph is the processing system such as uh, FPGA, DSPs, microcontrollers, etc. <clears throat> in fact, FPGA had proved to be a powerful tool in biomedical signal processing. Their main features are parallelism that uh, allow to execute simultaneous process, a uh, high speed, and uh, another important feature is the low integration, scale, and low power consumption of uh, of the development board, such as a C-mode A7 of Digiland. Indices, a wide variety of ECG indices are currently available. Two of the most important are uh, hair rate variability, that is a predictive parameter in the diagnosis of uh, hair attach, coronary atherosclerosis, and sudden death. Uh, the QT interval duration is another important indicator with prolongation, dispersion, and alteration in their dynamics are related to the risk of developing malignant arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death. Uh, the detection of the beginning of Q uh, wave in real time increased the computational complexity considerably. Thus, the measurement of the RT interval is an excellent form to estimate the QT interval. The background algorithms for detection of the QRX complex and T wave. Currently, there are many articles uh, of methods for detection of the characteristic points of the ECG. Despite this, uh, almost all of them are uh, implemented offline. Uh, the first uh, work that you present is Pan and Topkins that you use a band pass filter. The problem with that is that the bandwidth of the QRX complex and the noisy are overlapped. The Pablo Laguna uses a differentiator low pass filter for the detection of the QT interval. In this case, the use of derivatives generate a better effect for the a reliable detection of the QRX complex. 
Li, Shen, and Tei uh, are the first to use the wavelet transform to detect characteristic points of the ECU. They use only uh, these grid scales with values of power of two that it delimits uh, the, the analysis. Um, these last two techniques uh, inspired Carlos Alvarado for his wavelet transform uh, algorithm with, uh, with the splines. Um, he had a high percent of accuracy. Uh, he used different scales for QRX complex and T-wave. Um, some there are some uh, uh, works that in, that algorithms for impl for the detection of the QRX complex implemented on FPGA. In this case, uh, Stohanovic used an acyclone FPGA for real-time detection of the QRX complex. And the large dimension of the development board and the discrete uh, makes it suitable for uh, portable systems. Uh, Frank Martinez and Carlos Alvarado uh, implemented the uh, algorithm for real-time airway detection of, uh, on basic stress development board Arctic, uh, with a Arctic 7 FPA. In this case, the, the algorithm only can detect uh, a positive polarity of the QRX complex. Materials and methodology. Uh, three, element, three main elements were used uh, for this work. We use an, uh, a Siling CMOD 87 development board, which contains a low power consumption Arctic 7, a Texas Instrument ADS 1294 integrated circuit with a low power consumption, four channels for the acquisition, and 24 bits uh, analog to yield digital converter, and specific uh, models for uh, the ACG acquisition. Um, 16 gigabytes uh, ESD memory card. Um, well, according to the American Hair uh, Association, uh, established some recommendation for a reliable acquisition of the ECG. In this case, um, they, these are common mode reaction radio more or greater than 80 dBs, uh, minimal bandwidth of 0 0.05 to 100 hertz and a resolution of uh, 10 microvolts. Uh, for an orderly execution of the different models implemented, the main state machines maintain a synchronization between the different models uh, used to perform a specific process, such as uh, initialization of the micro ESD memory, the initialization of the ADS 1294, and the waiting for data that it consists in the reception of the information from the ADS 1294, the digital filter that delimit the bandwidth of the ECG signal, and the, the signal uh, processing that it consists to detect the QRX complex and the T end wave. In addition, the RT interval and the hair rate are measured. And finally, the signal storage. Uh, with the use of different uh, signals to that um, informate to the main process that all of this process was carried out successfully. And a parallel process to displace the, the values of the RT interval and the hair rate bit to bit uh, into uh, L LCD display. The digital filter. The digital filter was implemented in the FPA using a filter uh, designer tool of MATLAB, which generates the coefficients of the fear filter from specific characteristics. Those characteristics are a uh, low pass response, filter fear using a Windows HAMI, uh, the filter of the order was 10, a cutoff frequency of 200, and a sampling rate of 1000. And the coefficients were exported to the implementation to the filter in BHDL according to the equation one. The algorithm for the text detect the QRX complex and the T wave. Um, we have some improvements we improvements with respect of the prototype for Ram Martinez. These improvements are the algorithm can detect two different polarities in the morphology of the QRX complex, positive and negative, and also for the T wave. And it only used uh, the eight scale from the wavelet transform for the detection of t broad wave. Um, the use of wavelet transform generates a positive and a, mod a negative modules 
uh, whose position will depend on the polarity of the QRX complex, as we can see in these examples. Um, a flag sets the order of the steps that the algorithm will follow. We use uh, a, a flag, in this case is this one. If the algorithm detects by adaptive thresholds the first negative models, in this case, um, a flag is activated and the, the following steps are the detecting of the point P1, that it consists in a zero cross in the wavelet transform, uh, detect the positive modules in this case, and finally the second point P2, that, is, that correspond to the second zero crossing. And all these detection are uh, performing at the specific times, and uh, if they are not met, the detection of the QRX complex is discarded. The fear state consists in a delay to, to, to for the, the, the looking for the T wave, and a neat uh, delay depends on the previous hair rate value. For the T wave detection, the same methodology is used in order to detect the different polarities of the uh, T wave morphology using, of course, different uh, search time because the duration of these waves are different. Um, for, for the other case, it, a positive model is detected at first, uh, the flag is activated in this case, and the search sequence changes. The next step is to follow the point P1, then the negative models, and finally the second, uh, P, the second point P2. And that's how the uh, algorithm works. Results and discussions. Uh, for stimulation of the prototype, a signal was generated um, with a sinusoidal signal with a frequency that increments in steps of 5 hertz. Approximately at the frequency of 200, the input-output ratio is close to uh, 0 0.7, which corresponds to the cutoff frequency. To test the algorithms, uh, we use uh, some recordings acquired by uh, the designing prototype from different Fisionet databases that can be uh, obtained in the page of the Fisionet and, and they were used. In this case, we, uh, we can see uh, lines red that represent the detection of the QRX complex and uh, the, the final of the uh, T wave. In, th in this case, we show that uh, we have different morphologies. We have a QRX complex with a polarity positive and a T wave with a polarity positive. In this case, we have a QRX with a negative polarity and an inverted uh, T wave. In this, in this case, we, we observe that we detect a, a, a correct, the, we have a correct detection, sorry. The validation of the algorithm to detect the QRX complex. Uh, we use 10 records from the QT database and in this table, we show the results obtained in the detection of the QRX complex. We achieve a detection rate over the 97%. Um, what's the problem with some false detections? The false detection in some records is due to uh, abrupt uh, amplitude and bas baseline variations in this case. Um, the measurement of the mean error and the standard deviation was performed for the de for the detection or the localization of the final of the T, uh, the end of the T wave. Sorry. Um, the specialists suggest a maximum value of 3.6 milliseconds for the standard deviation. We achieved uh, <clears throat> a mean of the error of 5.14 milliseconds and um, mean of the uh, standard deviation of the error for 7.07 milliseconds. The values obtained are within the limits suggested by the specialists. The graphical interface displays the values obtained by the prototype and stored in the SD memory. The first graph shows the hair rate variability and the second graph shows the variability of the RT interval. And finally, the dynamics of the RT interval with respect of the hair rate is displayed. The results and discussions, the finished prototype and power consumption. 
The electronic board was designed to integrate the main elements of the device. Um, the prototype displays uh, in real time the, the values of the hair rate and the RT interval bit to bit, like we can see. The main dimensions, uh, the main characteristics of the prototype was dimension of 77 millimeters by 102 uh, millimeters by 50.4 millimeters. The weight is uh, 425 grammars. The consumption is uh, 80, 85 milliampers at five volts in a normal operation, and the battery life was the 30 hours, 36 hours. Sorry. That it exceeds the minimum, exceeds the minimal 24 uh, continuous operation requirements for holders, of course. The conclusions: the system displays in real time the hair rate and the RT interval of the one lead. The algorithm implemented in the FPA uh, can detect two different morphologies of, uh, or polarities of the QRX complex with a currency of 97%, and also it's able to detect the T end wave with an error or uh, 5.144 milliseconds, uh, plus minus uh, 7.047 milliseconds. Both measurements are within the tolerance and limits for the deviation with respect to the error suggested by the specialist. Um, the ADS uh, 1294 uh, features a CMRR greater than 80 dBs and a resolution of uh, 671 uh, nanovolts according to the uh, American Hair Association specifications. The consumption of the device was reduced due to the use of low consumption and low scale FPA added to tease the ability to perform parallel processing and make the FPA an attractive tool uh, for the use and uh, monitor holder. This, those are my reference and thank you for uh, attending this uh, work. Any questions? Thank you very much, Jose Alberto, for your presentation. Do we have any questions, please, from the attendees? Yes, I have a question. Jesus Antonio, please. You can open your microphone. OK, can you listen to me? Yes. yes. OK. I want to thank you for your presentation and I would like to know about the cost of the full system and if you have considered uh, the cost of the of the software that you were using. I mean, you were using MATLAB for the uh, for processing the signal. So uh, if you have a, any future, uh, I, uh, um, if you want to continue this process, but using free software well that would be my question thank you for your question uh well the exactly uh, value of the all the all the prototype i can remember for example the fpa cost uh 87 dollars the ads uh, 1294 uh, it cost uh, uh i can remember i can uh, 20 20 dollars and that's that's uh, the most uh, cost elements, more or less. Um, um, I know one hundred fifty dollars. It's the it's the cost of the prototype, and well, we are working on that. Um, for uh, you say me about uh, some uh, free software. Free software. Okay. Well, actually, I'm working on that. Uh, we we want to do some um, to get some some things. Um, we are actually working on that. But when we we uh, get a finally uh, um, interface, a graphical interface, uh, we we'll, we think if we is, we uh, get a, a a free access for that. But actually, I'm working. We are working on that. 
Okay, thank you so much. I have another question if you if you allow me. Uh, what would be the, the the advantage of your development uh, comparing uh, comparing it uh, against um, some wearables? Um, I mean some some watches, smart watches. Um, do you have you ever considered the uh, the advantage over these these wearables? Yes. Um, well. The advantage in this case is that we uh, detect in, in the hair rate and the earth interval bit to bit, okay? And some of these uh, tools, <clears throat> they only made an uh, estimate on a uh, average of the of the values of the hair rate and well, that's the most most common uh, uh, indice, <clears throat> but um, we made a uh, traditional analysis. Of course, we are working on the use of wearables for um, in, in, uh, for for leaves the use of electrodes. Of course, it's better the use of wearables, and we are trying to evolutionate the the, the prototype at that step. But the real contribution of this uh, of this work it's the the algorithm that can detect. Different, por different polarities of the of the QRX and the T wave, and and also make a, a robust analysis. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jesus Antonio, for your question, and thank you very much, Jose Alberto, for your presentation and your answers. Uh, because of the time, we have to continue. The last question was very, very interesting, I think. Um, um, wearables are using photoplethysmographic signal and uh, Jose Alberto is using the ECG. So it's not the same. They have a lot of advantages, but that will be a big, big and large discussion. So it will be very interesting, but we have to continue with our next presentation. Thank you very much, Jose Alberto. Um, OK, our uh, last presentation of this session is by Edel Serafin Hernández Gómez. Uh, Edel, please, could you uh, share your presentation? Uh, I see two Edel Serafins in the room. So could you uh, please, Edel, yes. please could you please uh, raise your hand so I can raise give your you hand, Edel, Edel. so that we can allow you to share. Or please let us know on the chat. OK, uh, can you see uh, Jorge, the, the hand? You can uh, share and speak now, Edel. Excellent, OK. Right, Edel is going to present the paper Open-Ended Coaxial Proof Technique for the Measurement of the Ionic Strength due to Magnesium Sulfate Heptahydrate in Water. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Edel. Do you have your camera? Can we see you? Is it possible to have it on? Oh, yes, sir. Thank you, Edel. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Edel Serafin Hernandez Gomez, and I will present the topic uh, Open Ended Quackshark Pro Technique for the measurement of the ionic strength due to magnesium sulfate heptahydrate in water. Okay, the session is divided as follows. Introduction, introduction, dialectic properties, methodology, results, conclusion, and reference. Introduction. Well, uh, water quality is considered as a, a measure of physical, chemical, 
biological and microbiological characteristics of water. Uh, the importance of its analysis um, is considered in different cases, uh, such as the verification of lipid samples according to standards, the assessment of, of systems uh, that are used to water treatment, and so on. Uh, the total dissolved solid, a TDS, is a parameter considered for different agencies and organizations, uh, such as Environmental Protection Agency, uh, EPA from USA, and World Health Organization. Uh, the uh, typically determined by the ionic strength, and in turn, the ionic strength is determined in different ways. The electrical meter is used to the uh, the ionic time. But only measures up to 0 0.32 molar. Uh, the gravimetric method is used to, to measure higher level, levels of ionic and uh, those from electrical conductivity. But in this method, the gravimetric method, the lipid sample must be conveyed to the laboratory. So, for this reason, uh, there is no real time measure. Uh, on the other hand, the sulfate heptahydrate is a natural mineral compound. In water, it uh, produces the ions, sulfate, and magnesium. The magnesium can be considered in terms of calcium carbonate. These ions uh, are the most common in ground water. And uh, this type of water uh, is the source of drinking water for at least 50% of world population. So the objective of this work was to dielectrically characterize several liquid samples with different concentration of magnesium sulfate heptahydrate in order to determine that the open structure probe can be used for measuring white ionic strength range and provide information for designing open permittivity detectors in the microwave range that measure ionic strength higher than 0.32 molar and in real time, uh, dielectric property. Uh, uh, complex relative uh, permittivity can be, can be expressed in terms of real, real part that is called dielectric constant and the imaginary part that is called the uh, The dielectric constant uh, measure the ability of a uh, material to store electromagnetic energy. A loss factor is characterized by the amount of electromagnetic energy uh, converted into heat by a material. The most common models to describe the electrical behavior of Diffuse electrolytic uh, solutions for animal tissues are, are divided, called cold, cold Davidson models, but they can be represented uh, collectively by the Havelian Negami relaxation model. And its parameters are this the electric constant on the uh, DC electric constant at infinity frequency, 
the second activity characteristic relaxation time of the medium permittivity of free space angular frequency alpha and beta are empirical variables that account for the distribution of the relaxation time and the asymmetry of the relaxation time distribution respectively methodology uh, well, the open and structure probe technique is, a, is used to characterize a material by permittivity in the microwave range uh, of, of non resonant type. Uh, in this method, the open structure probe is pressed against the material or immersed in a liquid. And the uh, reflection coefficient is measured for computing the permittivity. Uh, in order for the measurement to be referenced on plane A, the, it is necessary to go from plane B to plane A through a gradient process. Uh, this process the uh, load open and short uh, standards are used. Load is this the ionized distilled water. Okay, measurement uncertainty is the range of value within which a uh, true value measurement is considered light. Uh, uncertainty is divided into the type A and type B. Uh, type B is due to repeatability, and type B is due to systematic errors. And type B is divided into by calibration and by deviation. So uh, in the uncertainty by calibration, the permittivity of a uh, of a uh, measure ref reference uh, sample is compared against that reported in the literature. And in the uncertainty due to deviation, the permittivity of a uh, measure reference sample is compared in different instances of time. Result. A 35 liter sample with the ionic uh, water and different concentration of magnesium sulfate heptahydrate were prepared. The range of magnesium sulfate heptahydrate went from 0 to 65,000 milligrams per liter. And this caused the ionic strength to range from to 10.553 molar. And in table one, I am showing the examples with most notable changes in permittivity uh, with respect to the ionic strength. The sample of WD1, in this case, uh, had the uh, had the the, the lowest value ionic strength. And the liquid sample WD32 had a high level of ionic strength. Okay, in figure 1A, uh, the variation of the dielectric constant can be seen in the range uh, from 500 megahertz to 20 gigahertz. And uh, while the figure 1D, a uh, uh, percentage of the variation of the dielectric constant can be can be observed. This uh, this percentage was 
uh, was computed by the three. Uh, is, uh, its parameters are are one change percentage of dielectric constant. Uh, the second one is dielectric constant of sample under test. And the other one is the electric constant of the ionized steel water. Um, okay, in figure, figure 2A, the variation of the loop structure can be seen uh, in range from 500 megahertz to 20 gigahertz, while in figure B, the percentage of the variation of the loop factor can be observed. This percentage was computed by the parameters of change percentage of loose factor. The second one is the loose factor of all under test. And the third one, third one is the loose factor of the ionized steel water. Uh, uh, as as we saw, the variation of the loose factor uh, was higher than those for the electric constant. Okay, three shows ionic strength with the loose factor measured by the open quackshaft probe. The ionic strength that can be measured by the loss factor at 500 megahertz um, goes from 0 0.0008 to 1,178 molar. So with this, uh, this information, you can see that there is a good uh, correlation between the, the discrete data and the report. So, uh, conclusion, the ionic strength can be determined by using a loss factor at 500 megahertz, and a wide ionic strength range can be measured by the open quantum probes. And the result of this work could be used for the design of other particular sensors in the range of microwave focus and measure it a wide ionic strength range and in real time. Uh, here are the references. And that's thank you. Thank you very much, Edel, for your presentation. Do we have any questions from the attendees? Okay, um, and then I have a question. How can you compare your technique with other techniques? Are there any other techniques commercially available equipment to make the same type of measurement? Well, um, in this world, we, we compare uh, the range of ionic strength uh, to electrical conductivity meter, and that can only measure from uh, zero to uh, zero point thirty two molar of ionic strength, and uh, we we only we only read that information. We don't we don't use that uh, measurement. But in the future, uh, I think that we we have to compare with the measurement the laboratory our method with other methods. Okay, thank you very much, Edel. Any question from the attendees? Okay, I don't see any questions. So thank you very much, Edel, for your presentation and your answer. Okay. 
And well, this is our last presentation. We closed uh, this session by you too. Thank you very much for your attendance. I hope you enjoy it and we will see you next year with the bio sessions. Thank you very much to all of you.